Good evening, NorCal Carters. It is Monday, Memorial Day, as May 25th, 2020, and we have Gary Carlton back with us for the fourth episode in our little mini series of uh, Gary's taking us through pretty much his whole career up till today. <laughs> and then we're going to look ahead a couple of weeks and uh, we have some racing getting underway. Uh, Gary, thanks again for taking the time to do this. This is, it's been very enjoyable for me just to listen to the stories. And um, I kind of thought I knew you, but uh, I definitely learned a lot more through the podcast. So thank you. Oh, no, thanks for having me on and thanks for letting me do it later so I can get my work done during the day. And then uh, being at Memorial Day, I'd like to I'd like to thank everyone that has served and is currently serving now, you know, for them to give up their freedom to fight for ours. I think that's, you know, the ultimate sacrifice. And being that uh, my dad was also in the military, you know, I take those things quite seriously. And uh, I just want to thank everyone, you know, for their sacrifice. It's really noble thing to do. And um, I think, you know, one day of recognition is not nearly enough. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that. It's not national barbecue and drink day. It's, um, it's a, it's a somber event. I mean, we're, we're supposed to remember those that have fallen and, uh, and especially the families. I mean, you, you know, just supporting the families that lost loved ones in war. Um, it as you get older, you kind of look back and reflect and say, Oh, wait, yeah, there's a lot more meeting to, uh, to the holiday. So thank you for no, exactly. mentioning that. Yeah, I think it's, uh, like like you said, some of the families that have had the ultimate sacrifice. Uh, one day of uh, recognition doesn't do them any justice at all. So thank you for, for everyone that served and the continued serving you again. Yeah, absolutely. Because, uh, I mean, come on, let's be honest. We're pretty spoiled um when <laughs> our biggest concern is how do we put food on the table while working in an industry we absolutely love um it almost doesn't get much better than that does it no and, it, and to be honest and not to get too political about it but i mean you know many people think seem to think there's many things wrong with our country and i'm not one to say we live in a perfect country but being that I've been so many different places around the world and actually lived in different places, trust me. <laughs> trust me, uh, as a country, we are so much further along and so much in a better place than many other places in the world. So, you know, yes, it's not, we're not perfect. Yes, we have many problems, but in the grand scheme of things, we're doing a we're, we're a lot better off than many many other people that live around you know in different parts of the world. Yeah, you know, in that we won't make it too political, but yeah, you know, mm-hmm. I've had a couple of conversations with some friends about you know quality of living in America and things like that, and I, I just simply asked them, well, just drive down the ten in El Paso in Texas and look south. Um. The 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 social difference it just a hundred yards away in Mexico is incredible, um, and and I think more people need to be reminded about that and and appreciate what we have. Oh, one hundred percent. Actually, I've done that drive once, and it is kind of shocking <laughs> in the sense of you look at one side and you got IKEA, and McDonald's, and all these nice places, and then. You know, like you say, 100 yards away, there's, you know, literally people living in huts and, and things like that. So, like I said, not to get too political. I mean, today is about remembering the heroes that have sacrificed, given the biggest sacrifice of all for for our freedom to live in, in the country that we do. And if you like it or hate it, I mean, it, and, and that doesn't matter. It's it's all about the remembering those who have fallen today. Absolutely. Absolutely. So with that being said, um, you know, we had we had a couple of questions come in over the past couple of weeks and we never really presented them to you. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, let's just jump right into it. Um, so one of the questions was, how many days a week did your dad 
take you to Dixon to test when you were a kid? Oh, well, I mean, I went to, I went to public school. So, I mean, obviously, you know, Monday through Friday, I was in school. Um, and then we just go out every weekend, you know, um, uh, I would say we would go to Dixon quite a bit. We sometimes went away to Reading when I was a little bit older, older, meaning like 13, 14 to 15 years old. And I actually remember going out up to Reading with Rainey and Mike Speed and Scott Speed and Alex, because obviously Dixon, you know, is a great track to try and test chassis and do chassis development because, you know, the nature of the track, but there's no real long straightaway and it's not even, not even really straight. So it's kind of hard to test engine stuff in up in Reading. You know, we could use that really long straightaway at, at certain track configuration. And I remember Rainey when he really wanted to test something that was really important to him or we had a bunch of, you know, stuff to test. We'd go up there to Reading and being that I was living in Marysville at the time where now I'm back, obviously, but it's only a two hour drive from our house, actually an hour and 45 minutes, which is about the same as Sonoma. And, you know, we, before Sonoma, Reading was kind of our engine test track, you know, being it was closest to us. And, um, but yeah, I mean, we just go on every weekend, every weekend to answer the question bluntly. Um, I can't remember if it was, you know, both days. I mean, I didn't really remember going out in the winter time, um, even though if it was raining or if it was like super foggy, as some people know in, in Dixon, it's out in the middle of the fields, and can get super foggy where you can literally not see the other end of the track. And, you know, there would be nobody out there but us and my dad. If it was, you know, dry enough, we'd be on slicks. If it was still wet, we'd be on wet tires. And a lot of times you'd just send down on slicks when it was even too wet for slicks, but he didn't want to mount the rain tires or maybe it was just a, a little bit, or uh, just dry enough where maybe it would uh, abuse the rain tires and he didn't want to send the money to, <laughs> to you know, obviously ruin rain tires. So we just go out on slicks. But, yeah, I mean, it was just kind of an every weekend thing, I would say. I mean, every weekend I was out at the track. But during the weekdays and everything, we, we really wouldn't go to the track. I, the only time I remember going on weekdays was um, on Wednesdays out to Sonoma. And sometimes you'd pull me out of school. But that was more at the kind of the end of my career. And I think I might have – yeah, man, I really can't I remember getting pulled out of school much other than for races and, and whatnot. So – um, just to, just more of a weekend thing. And also my dad had to work during the week too. So it wasn't like a thing where we could go out, you know, when we wanted. I think a lot of now how people are setting their kids up now as they're doing homeschooling and everything. And so they can get, you know, more track time during the weeks. If, uh, you know, the weekends are a little bit too much crowded, but I don't remember it being super crowded during the weekends, at least even at Dixon. So. Yeah. Now, do you recall, I don't, I don't know when this transition happened um, in Northern California, but when I was racing a lot, it seemed like every single weekend we would, we had like a core group of guys that just went from track to track to track to track. And it was always club racing. Um, and honestly, I don't really remember doing hardcore testing more so than just going to the next race event, which was next weekend. Um, and then nowadays it seems like, okay, we plan on a big race every month or two. And then we're out the track every single weekend, test, 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 or drive, drive, drive. Do you kind of recall it that way as well? And you know, while you were saying that, I was trying to remember, and I honestly don't really remember <laughs> if it was testing or club racing. I mean, I remember going to club races and, and things like that. Um, I remember the Tri-County Series. But I don't remember – I guess I remember the winter testing, but I, I, I guess you're right. I don't know if I remember going out and practicing that much, you know, between the races in the summertime. I, I really I, – to be honest, I really don't remember, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> you, you get <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know if it's that or just had so – you know, when you have so many experiences, like, I swear, like, I mean, obviously going through this mini series, it's like – so many different chapters in of my career and life that, you know, all of it kind of gets blended together. And I remember actually going, coming up on some old photos 
of races that I did in Europe. I mean, obviously, I was only, you know, it was 13 years ago, which, I mean, is a long time ago, but it, in turn, it, it's not. And people think, oh, I would, you know, they go to a race in Europe or, you know, go to these different places, and maybe, oh, I'd never forget. And then I remember seeing pictures, and I'm like, I totally forgot about that race. You know, yeah, I remember that race. Has it now, already been 13 years? Two. 13 years was from the first time I went to Europe, yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was 2007, we're at 2020, so yeah, 13 years. And now, and then you're t- asking me, you know, when I was club racing, I mean, that was over 20 years ago, so, you know, I guess it, I can have a little leeway and not remember it. <laughs> yeah, it's 20 years ago, and you were definitely a younger teen at that time when you were in NorCal. Yeah, well, yeah, 24 years ago, I mean, I was nine years, nine years old, 19 years old, so. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Actually, you know what? This is a good, you brought this up at the last podcast and you're talking about the Europe experience. And I had Andy Seisman on um, a couple of days ago. And we were talking about his upcoming event in Phoenix. And he was kind of giving us just a preview and a rundown of what to expect in Phoenix with the different um, procedures that are going to be following. And a question came up. We were talking about you and it was one of the you had mentioned one of the factories you had worked for and we were both saying how everyone feels that, um, you know, be the factory driver is so glamorous. You show up with your helmet, you fly in in your private jet and you get to go test go-karts every single day. But there was one particular manufacturer you were a factory driver for and you went to the track five times all year. Which manufacturer was that? Well, I don't want to throw anyone under the boat, um, but that was when I was running with IAMI and Zanardi Kart. And basically what it was, they were having a, quite a bit of problems with the engines. And it wasn't necessarily that they didn't want to go test. It was they were just having some problems on the dyno, and they just felt, you know, at that point in time, they didn't really have many things to test. Um, and I'm not going to sit here and badmouth IAMI. I'm there, obviously one of the leading, if not the leading cart engine manufacturer in the world. I mean, they obviously know what they're doing. They have, uh, they build a great product. I mean, it shows with the X30 program what they, what they've been able to build worldwide and everything else. And they've won, you know, European and world titles with their, their okay engines and, and even their KZ engines. So it was just, I was kind of there at the, the building block here and, it was just, you know, a tough year. They didn't have the right pieces in place. And, um, you know, eventually they, they did did find their way. And, I mean, here I was, you know, at the 2000, whatever, whatever year I won it with, with IAMI. I won it on an IAMI product the last time I won Supernat. So, I mean, they obviously got it right, you know. Um, but, yeah, it was just, it, that's that was the situation. And, I mean, I remember many factory teams that I ran with. I mean, there was very limited testing. Um, what a lot of the drivers would do was actually either get carts or, I mean, a lot of them would do that go back to their respective countries that they lived in and they would work for the importer of that particular factory that they remember racing for. And through the importer, they would have a chassis and an engine and everything there and drive with them and, and coach with their team. And naturally I, you know, my importer, so to speak, or anyone that would have been working with the American market, I mean, you naturally can't fly back and forth from Italy to, to California or Italy, even to, you know, the East coast, wherever the importer may be. So I was kind of stuck in the sense of, you know, it wasn't just a couple hour fo- plane ride to an importer that I could go drive go-karts and you know maybe maybe my talent wasn't looked at as highly as maybe other drivers so I kind of had to work my way in the factory and you know being that that they had basically free labor or very you know low paying labor and then I would you know run the race team or you know load the trailers build all the race team cars to do whatever I needed to do I, I can kept kept my place you know so yeah i mean it's, it's every everyone's situation's a bit different everyone's uh you know 